Good to be here again and today I'd like to talk about the, the fascinating subject of phrasing and it's interesting that, that phrasing is, is really rather a different kind of concept to players with different instruments. Uh, string players for example when they consider phrasing will think about up and down bows. Uh, pianists will consider textures and multiple lines and singers have words obviously to think about. Um, in phrasing clarinet music, we are just thinking about supporting a single line through our breathing. Um, it's a very many faceted subject, really, and musicians, clarinetists, players are always constantly trying to unlock its secrets. So let's think about speaking first. Here's a, a statement. Uh, and we can say this statement with many meanings depending on how we say it. I'm good at scales, a simple statement. I'm good at scales, kind of asking a question. I'm good at scales, kind of said with pride. I'm good at scales, kind of thinking about it. I'm good at scales, as if you really don't believe it. Um, and you could you could try to, to convey a more complex sentiment, for example, I'm not going to have a go, but maybe you can try this, you know, with, with a degree of incredulity, delighted at having achieved full marks on scales at an exam, having thought that you've done rather badly. Um, now you could also try um, putting uh, an emphasis on each individual word um, and see what that does. Um, for example, I'm good at scales, but you're better or not as good. I'm good at scales, even if you don't think so. I'm good at scales, but can't tongue them. I'm good at scales, but not so good at oral work or, or whatever. Um, and the difference is actually conveyed um, in various different ways. For example, I'm using different kinds of inflection in my voice, almost different kinds of timbre. You know, I, I change the quality very slightly. Nuance. Um, is fascinating, just, you know, the colour slightly of the way I pronounce words. Emphasis, um, I put emphasis on certain words. I punctuate um, to, to some degree. A and in a sense, rhythm as well, the rhythm of the way I say these words. Uh, and once we've said these words with a meaning, with the meaning that you wish to convey, we might say that we've given the phrase a shape. The same, of course, is absolutely true in musical phrasing. Let's take, for example, um, the first phrase in Brahms's great second clarinet sonata. Uh, and interestingly, um, there are several ways of phrasing this. Uh, and none are right, none are wrong. It depends on what you'd like to do. So, and I'm going to give you just a few examples, and, and there are more. Um, and it doesn't matter, but it's interesting. For example, you may make to, to wish to make that G, the top note, which is an appoggiatura. Um, it's a, an E flat major, uh, transpose obviously for piano, or oh, transpose for clarinet, it's an E flat major harmony, uh, all the way through that bar, and the G is an appoggiatura, um, and then it resolves onto the F. So you may wish to, to make that the most glowing note. This The movement is full of expressive, Appoggiaturas is also the highest note of the phrase. Uh, let, let me have a go at doing that. Um, I don't know whether I did that terribly successfully, but I was trying to feel the, the G as being the high note. Um, so, and in a sense then, um, it gave it the, the, that kind of shape um, slightly below. Um, you may wish to direct the phrase all the way through to the B flat um, or even to the final E. Let me go to the B flat. Or slightly differently, I, I'm just kind of thinking right the way through to the E. Uh, and knowing the harmony, of course, um, helps because um, the upbeat E, the second note, is a kind of 
uh, is an upbeat, it's a secondary upbeat. Uh, and so you might want to put a little emphasis on that note. Let me try that. Um, and and uh, slightly, I was just trying to emphasize the second note as, as an upbeat to the G. Um, none of these are right or wrong, but they're interesting. Uh, and it begins to give the phrase more kind of shape and meaning. And of course, one of the exciting aspects of phrasing is, is that it can be as complex, subtle, many layered or simple as you like. Um, you might wish to put a little energy on the second note, make the third note glow, but still aiming for the B flat uh, and maintaining a clear sense of movement right through to the end of the final E. And behind all these nuances, you know, there may be delicate crescendos and diminuendos and maybe some rubato. Uh, and all this adding up together is what I, I call this quantum phrasing, which I think gives our, our performances shape and direction and colour and meaning. Of course, you don't have to think through and analyse every, every, every phrase that you play. Um, it's just once you're into this kind of thinking, I think it will happen automatically. Uh, and of course, another aspect is, is where you breathe. Um, that's another area that, that needs to be considered. Um, and, and that's obviously concerned with your personal breath control. Uh, how many notes can you play before you run out of breath? Uh, and, and so you'll have to take that into account. Interestingly, um, the great Carl Leister sometimes recommends taking a breath rather dramatically, rather theatrically. Um, so you don't in try to hide it. It's actually part of the drama of the music. And there's a number of um, instances in, in the Brahms where this kind of dramatic breathing might actually add to the intensity of the performance. It's all up to you. There's yet another level to quantum phrasing. Um, but just in getting there, we need to look at upbeats and downbeats. Interesting, I think. I find this very interesting. In the act of walking, what exactly propels us forward? Well, scientifically, it's quite a complex manoeuvre, you know, to do with friction and forces and such like. We don't need to worry about that. But if we walk up walking more simply, one foot is put downwards on the ground, then the other is picked up, swung forwards and put down, and then the other is picked up, swung forwards and put down and so on and so on. And we are walking, we're moving forwards. Um, and so we could really, in a sense, um, make a connection between picking the foot up is the upbeat, putting the foot down is the downbeat. When we put our foot down, it's not actually moving. Um, it's passive. Um, when we pick our foot up and swing it forward, it is moving, it's dynamic. So in fact, the actual moment of movement comes with picking our foot up and swinging it forward. So we might say the energy is in the picking the foot up. The energy is in the upbeat rather than the downbeat. The, the downbeat is passive, there is energy there, but it's a different kind of energy. Just watch the person walking again and just think about this as, as you see in walking. Uh, and I think that's really rather interesting. Often the energy in a phrase or a passage is to be found in the upbeats. So to give music a sense of rhythm, a sense of forward drive, uh, a sense of shape and direction, we need to think about upbeats. Um, but, but before we do that, let's just have a look at this word rhythm. It actually derives from the Latin rhythmus, um, which means movement in time, and also the, the, the Greek word rhythmos, um, which means measured flow or movement. Movement is the essence. Movement gives a sense of flow, energy, action, progress. On the other hand, when music is played without these qualities, movement and flow, energy, action, these things, it can sound a bit dull and inactive and, and lifeless and immobile. It's not to say that these qualities don't occur as musical character, but I think there's a difference between musical character and the rhythmical drive that causes music to move forward, which gives it its shape and direction. Let's have a look at the, the Brahms again. There are a number of ways we can interpret the inner rhythmic drive based on the upbeats. The, the second note um, is 
and upbeat uh, and therefore it has some kind of internal energy and um, which propels it forward towards the expressive appoggiatura g and then the f which is the resolution what happens next is quite interesting um, and in the following example you know that i'll put the dotted slur in to show you how you might think about it they're not they're not slurring um, the articulation is Brahms, of course, but here we resolve onto that F and then the two last notes in our minds become a kind of upbeat. Um, and we could either feel the A and the D together or we could feel just the G, the D. Uh, and of course, all these gives a slightly different feel to it. And there's yet another um, more subtle way where, where the F can be felt as a kind of a resolution and part of the upbeat. I, I'm not going to play these. I, I, I would like you to have an experiment and, and see what you might discover. Of overriding importance, of course, is to think in long, beautiful, unbroken lines. That's what clarinet phrasing is all about. But thinking through these tiny details of each phrase during practice, I think opens the mind to many potential possibilities and you know spontaneously in a performer you might just feel a little leaning towards one shape over another that you know at that instant lends lends itself to to creating you know a lovely musical moment entirely up to you and it, it must be similar to the way that actors give shape to, to their words you know the favorite the famous uh, Shakespeare line to be or not to be there are so many ways that that, that you can phrase that um, and each of them as effective as the other. And I know I do, do actors say, say at the same time, every time they perform that line, I don't suppose they do. Um, and the, the meaning is just slightly different. Let's have a listen um, to a couple of performances um, of the uh, opening of the Brahms. And I've got two performances for you to listen to. Uh, here's one. Now, that is the, the great Reginald Kell, um, and there was rubato, all sorts of interesting inflections there. Here's the wonderful Carl Leister, very different. So it's up to you, but fascinating. Just want to talk about one more thing um, before closing today. Uh, Semiquaver passages. Uh, and let's look at this particular passage um, from the Mozart Concerto. There's all sorts of ways of thinking about this, but if you think about the upbeat idea, it can begin to give a sparkle, a rhythmical energy and vigor that, that is just amazing, really. Um, so, for example, um, and if I give you a slow motion, um, there, there are all the downbeats and then there are all these upbeats, the three upbeat notes leading to the downbeats. And if you feel the energy on the first of the upbeat notes, uh, <laughs> I was feeling just that energy, a little bit of extra energy on the G and the B and the D and the, the second D. And I think, I mean, no one probably will notice this, but, but some people will. They will just notice there's a real energy about it. The, the brackets, of course, don't indicate slurring or anything. It's just the musical grouping of these notes. There's another way of, of looking at it, in fact, um, which is kind of two fingered in two two. Um, and again, the same kind of idea. Uh, and again, those notes are the ones you feel the extra energy in. Uh, I put a bit of crescendo in there as well. But uh, you, you may or may not have noticed the difference, but I was feeling that difference. And, and to me, that's what gave it it's it's energy it's it's rhythmical impulse and i think by becoming more aware of these upbeats 
it adds immensely to to the shape and the phrasing and and it's together i call this quantum phrasing so have a lot of fun with phrasing now there's no right there's no wrong um well maybe sometimes you know you feel well that note was given perhaps a little bit too much emphasis in that phrase it probably shouldn't have had but i don't know i don't even know whether that's a possibility have fun with it i think you will enjoy it if you start thinking about phrasing in in this particular way some people do have particular strong views about the way they feel a phrase should be phrased but uh, i wouldn't worry too much about that um have a go and see what comes out so Happy phrasing and never be phased by phrase.